record. All right. And share screen. Okay, welcome to Art Appreciation. Uh, today we have a new artist, a couple new artists that we're going to talk about. Um, and if you click on lessons here, if you go to the main page on our website, uh, actually, you can't click here because I just put it in. Um, Hold on, I'm hear, hearing some background no noise. Laura, I don't know if you can try to mute yourself, but I'm not able to mute you. Okay, uh, so you've got to hover over this arrow to get to, or you can just click the link that I sent you. All right, we're getting a lot of background noise, everybody. So if you could please check yourself and make sure that you are muted. Still hearing somebody. Um, there we go. For some reason, it takes a minute there. And now I think everyone's muted. Okay, so you come, uh, you hover over lessons or you just click on the link that I gave you and you get to this page here, which has all the lessons, the same information in the handout that I already sent you, but then also a lot of videos. This is a great little video um, and some articles about this artist. And then maybe on Google a few weeks ago, you might have seen this come up if you were on Google and they actually did a celebration to Ruth Asawa, which is pretty fantastic that when we get uh, artists. Um, okay, let me just mute. Okay, so um, and then the other artist that we're talking about today is Orly Genger. She is um, a much younger artist and there are articles about her and what she's doing as well. If you find either of these artists interesting, you can always come here and read the articles I put up about them and the videos that I put up about their work. There's some pretty great videos on here and uh, a look into their work. Then again, I just want to remind you after class you can, um, in this case, I don't know, you'd have to learn how to weave to make a copy example from these artists, but maybe you've done some sort of other textile work um, in the past and you can leave a comment here. You can see that uh, people have started, not started, they've been leaving comments all semester and you can also leave, um, you know, other information here if you find an interesting article about the artist or if you have pictures from the show that you went to please um, feel free to do that. And the way it takes a minute to show up now because we have so many um, images here and comments, but you click this um, pink button here to add a comment. So I just wanna remind you all, I added some images here and I also added like a video link and some other people have put in some great artwork. So do take a look at that. I mean, it, it's hard when you post a comment and literally no one likes it or says anything about it. It's a lot more fun when people share in the fun and um, you know comment on each other's work and talk to each other about the work. So let's get to the artist today. The first artist that we have is Ruth Asawa. She was born in Norwalk, California on January 24th, 1926. And she was born to immigrant parents, um, Uma Kichi and Haru Asawa. And she was the fourth of seven children. Um, so this was during the time when the government decided to um, she wanted to go to school to be an artist, but instead the government created a Japanese American relocation camps and essentially put people in concentration camps. And she was one of the people who was taken out of her home. Um, let me see if I can find the exact uh, thing where it says that. Uh, in February 1942, her father was arrested by FBI agents uh, and separated from his family for six years. And a few months later, her mother had to orchestrate closing their farm. She, they had a farm and packing their belongings and they were forcibly removed from their home in Norwalk and moved to racetracks in Santa Anita and then later to a more permanent camp in Arkansas. Um, she went to school there and she was then one of those people who had to find whatever uh, resource that she had in order to make art. So she would just, you know, take any paper and any piece of string that she could find to make her artwork during that time. Um, so this is a pretty um, interesting story because we don't often like to talk about these things that happen to 
people in our country and the way that we sometimes treat them. And, and this is sort of one of those historical moments that uh, doesn't get talked about enough. And I think it's really important to bring this to the forefront because I'm sure it influenced her work so much. And she talks about how it did influence her career. So um, she first learned weaving when she was a camouflage, a volunteer camouflage net maker in the camp. And then um, she was later admitted to teacher's college and um, she studied in the teacher's college. She studied drawing, painting, printmaking. So always someone who's done a lot of things. But what I then found really interesting about her and maybe it's because I did a similar thing is that she went to Mexico City to be a teacher. Um, and there she was studying Spanish and Mexican art. I don't know why it says Spanish and um, Mexican art. And sorry, I lost my shoe. Um, she was studying Spanish art and it is there that she learned how to weave. Now, this wasn't like what I did where I went to an artist residency and I learned how to weave. Uh, this was her in, you know, walking around the city and then she encounters, and maybe you've seen these before in Mexico and uh, some Mexican homes, they have these metal hanging baskets that they put bananas and fruit in or they put eggs in them and um, they're just hanging egg baskets basically. And so that is uh, the, the wire system of weaving that she learned. I don't know this wire system, although you can see that it's just a series of loops that um, then interconnect with each other to make different shapes. Um, so really interesting that she travels to Mexico because she was encountering so much racism and that really is what steered her away from continuing her teaching career because people were not, uh, they didn't want her to be a teacher because of her ethnicity. So uh, I've noticed a lot of these artists that we talk about, people like uh, Philip Gustin, um, William Kendrich, Ruth Asawa, they've all encountered a lot of um, racism because of their ethnicity or, or where they came from. So I think that is really something I've been thinking a lot about in my work. And, um, you know, all of us have such interesting stories and why not, no pun intended here, weave the stories into the narrative of, of what you're doing. Um, all of us me. Uh, thinking about uh, Sheila Hicks as well and um, you know then back to traditional weaving and textile people all over the world who have had these ancient um, weaving techniques for thousands of years and now artists are coming along learning those techniques and then turning it into something more contemporary however she was doing it many many years ago and then she went to the Black Mountain School and that's this is the first time I've heard of this school I'm kind of embarrassed to say because it seems like it was a pretty big movement of artists that were um, uh, studying under Joseph Albers and um, it was a very ru rugged uh, school you know they didn't have they had hard beds and no running water and things like that it was more like uh, camping <laughs> not camping but um, it was a school out in I think Utah um, wait where is Black Mountain I don't know North Carolina, excuse me. Um, so, and she stayed there for three years uh, studying under Joseph Albers. And then there was also some other artists um, who were there as well. And what she learned there was experimentation. Um, it was a school that really pushed, uh, it says here in quotes, Black Mountain gave you the right to do anything that you wanted to do. So you didn't just take an object and turn it into a thing. You took an object and you turned it into a thing that turned into a thing that turned into a thing that turned into a thing. And it was about how far can we push this piece of paper? Can we fold it this way, turn it into this, turn it into that, grow it, change the size, you know, really exploring all the options of the material. And I think both of these artists do that um, in their work. So after her three years there, she moved to San Francisco um, and married Albert Lanier, Lanier, who was an architect. And then her career was really doing quite well. Um, she has always been a real activist for education and public education. And um, she's had a really good art career doing, she's 
all over the country. You can go into any major museum at this point and see her work. Um, one of my favorite shows of her that I saw was the um, women, it was a women show at not Hauser and Worth. Anyway, um, I'll think of it. Uh, but but she well let me get to let me get to Orly and then we will co start comparing them because um, I can talk all day about Ruth Asawa. But um, she's a really amazing artist who's very experimental. She's a sculptural artist and she uses metal wire to create her sculptures. Then we have Orly Genger, who was born in 1979. She lives and works in New York City. So what, that makes her 40 years old right now. Um, she's a tiny little thing. Um, and she uh, studied at Brown University and attended the Institute of Chicago. Um, she, is, uh, she does a lot of uh, park collections, installations, gallery installations, these huge pieces that are made out of weaving rope together and she weaves them on her arms. Um, you can really just YouTube it. It's basically using your arms as the knitting needles um, and you just pass the rope to each arm on each side. So she makes these long strips and then she stacks them or lays them or puts them together in different ways. Um, the way that she came about this process was because she was just practicing knitting and sort of as a pastime at home, you know, while watching TV, just making these little sections of color to study different stitches just for fun, just playing around. And then she, eventually she had piled up a whole bunch of these little pieces and um, she started playing with them and piecing them together. And then um, she decided she wanted to do this larger installation and knew that yarn wasn't really going to be the material that she could use. It was at that point that she found uh, climbing rope because she needed something really strong and sturdy that could live and survive outside. So that's when the scale of her work really changed and it really is, you know, there's, there's nothing that um, extraordinary it's more except for the size it's more the fact that she the repetition of it the amount of work that goes into it and just the sheer size of these sculptures that's going into it so she started using rope um, and then these pieces behind her are recycled fisherman rope but then she also uses climbing rope and and now I think she's trying to collect a lot more um, recycled rope at this time and use that kind of thing. So let's take a look at a few images. The first one I put up was uh, drawings from either of them. This one is Ruth Asawa and the one on the right. Uh, on, on the right is uh, Genger the whole time and on the left is Asawa the whole time. So as you can see, they both have an affinity towards um, multiple, multiplying things and lots of little shapes that build up to make a bigger shape. And I think that's essentially what knitting, crochet, weaving is. It's, it's working on a lot of little things to create a much bigger thing. Now, depending on the scale that you do it, it becomes a work of art or, or something else. So um, these first pieces here, uh, Ruth Asawa on the left, um, if you can imagine these hanging egg baskets in Mexico, then you can quickly understand what's going on here. Although she's taken it, again, she's taken a traditional material, she's taken a traditional technique, and she's turned it into something new. So, I mean, at this point in life, in 2019, you can't really invent something. I mean, I'm sure you can invent some things that are new, but the, really the way that you invent something new is by sourcing from the old and then making it new by the nature of what it came before it. In, in fact, you have to start with something and that something already started with something. So you are not really the inventor, unless you're the inventor of rope or the inventor of wire string, but that's already been invented. Maybe you invent a, a new material, but if you're using traditional materials, you have to come up with new ways that people haven't already used to make it interesting. 
So Ruth makes these long hanging, a lot of long hanging circular sculptures and there's oftentimes other sculptures within the sculptures. And she said she really likes to group the objects together because she thinks the negative space is just as important as the positive space. So both of these artists are using their environment um, when they install the work that is very important. You know what things are working within the sculptures and and that is really something when you're dealing with sculpture you're considering the environment that they're being put in and how will that will affect the sculpture and even make it part of the sculpture um, these rope pieces by uh, Genger are um, they're allowed to play on them they are some of them are even made to be laid on and sat on and a lot of these are painted as well. So it's the first she weaves them and then paints them, which I find interesting. And obviously at this point, she's got a group of people working under her. Although not as many as you would think, you know, some of these projects took take up to two years to install and create and weave. And she's got, you know, seven or eight people, but she said a lot of the time it was just me and one other person weaving away. And she says, you know, I use, the rope is so heavy that you, um, you know, you're pulling these things around and you, at the end of the day, you feel completely exhausted that you've used every single muscle in your body. Like I said, she's sort of a tiny, skinny, woman she's not um like a big strong woman and she's i mean maybe i'm sure she is strong but um you know it this is really heavy rope she said even having it lay on you feels very heavy and strange and almost scary sometimes so you know this is really an act of love and it's an it's her way of pushing something to the limit and really you know, seeing both of these women, how far can they push this idea of the experimentation? So um, all of this work is very much also about the process, if not more about the process than the end product. And I know that's hard for us as viewers to understand. Um, you know, when you think about performance art and things like that, you're thinking about um, the process of what's going on. But at the end of the day, there's only the end product to look at. Um, so however you feel about that. Another thing to consider in this work by Asawa is the shadows are often a big part of the work, it, especially depending on the way they choose to put the lighting. It creates almost a second weaving on the wall. So I thought that was another interesting layer to add. Uh, and this is all things that come up with sculpture. You know, do you hang them? Do you use stands? Does the stand become part of the art? You know, on and on and on. Or, you know, with the environment, outdoor environment, you've got things like trees and rocks and other things going on. And it was very important to her to use the environment, use the trees to make sure that these things are really working with the environment. So you can see here, this uh, piece is red, yellow, blue. She said she doesn't really like naming her pieces. She just does it because she has to. Um, uh, but you can see how she very thoughtfully made these lumps around the trees and they're really working with the environment. The sculpture is really part of the environment. Um, I discovered this artist when I started looking up any blanket artist I could find that was using, I, I wanted to just find, you know, textile artists and um, someone sent me this, this girl and I thought, wow, you know, this is, I w I've never seen one in person and I wonder if you have, if you've ever seen any of these installations. Um, they're all over the country. You can look them up. Uh, they don't stay up forever, obviously, because they're rope and they will decompose eventually. Um, but they are pretty sturdy for uh, a good a good while. I don't know how long she keeps these up, um, but it would be interesting to go see one in person wherever they may be. Uh, and then here's a close up of some of Ruth Asawa's sculptures and um, a lot of these are made from one single piece of wire, which is pretty amazing. Um, and uh, you can see how organic they are and how actually, in fact, both of these pieces are very organic. Both of these artists have, I don't know if you would consider it feminine organic, but it definitely has like a, 
organic cellular molecular quality to it. Um, Asawa usually leaves the color of the wire. She doesn't normally paint the wire, but she'll just buy black wire or copper wire or white wire, um, depending on what, what she wants to use for that piece. Uh, there were several pieces that were stacked um, <clears throat> in the museum and they were all painted gray. And uh, this was the only one I found that had this sort of ombre painting color where it seems like it's actually more along the lines of painting. Uh, you can decide for yourself. And this piece here, Ruth Asawa not only did weaving sculpture, but she did all kinds of sculpture. So this is an example of another kind of her sculpture. And maybe it was woven first and then dipped in something is what I'm thinking, but I actually don't know uh, how she made this piece. But either way, they relate in, in the sort of um, woven but not a blanket sort of way. Um, you know, these are, are turned into three-dimensional sculptures. They are not meant to be an item of clothing. They're not meant to be a bowl. They are meant to be art. And that is where things start changing, you know, um, where you're using an art artifact or if you're using an item and it is a bowl, uh, it, it, it and then, okay, well, let's talk about art and arts and crafts versus fine art as well. So I think we're finally coming to a place where fine art and art and craft craft have met, you know, um, whereas before weaving and knitting was considered artisan and um, all of those artisans who made all the ceramics and the weavings and the weepilis over centuries didn't even get to sign their name on the pieces they made, even though there was this, you know, incredible craft that had been passed down for years and years. It wasn't considered fine art. And it's finally being considered fine art because thanks to women and men like Ruth Asawa, like Orly Genger, like Sheila Hicks, uh, like uh, Christo, Jean-Claude and Christo, um, all of these people who are making textile into fine art. Um, either way, I find these pieces extremely enjoyable to look at because of the texture. And that is something that I think is really exciting when you went, really the most exciting thing about making weaving or about using a single string and then turning it into something three-dimensional. Um, you know, the texture quality, the way the light hits the lights and shadows, specifically in these pieces, I was um, at this time of day, you know, the sun is about to go down and you can really see these folds going back and forth. And you get the sense of this like giant organic form moving in space. But then, you know, these, the broke down, breakdown of the texture with the beautiful lights and darks, really, there's something about it. You know, you know, someone had to, had to have woven that and someone spent thousands of hours weaving these things. And uh, I'm here to tell you that weaving is a slow art. I mean, when I learned to backstrap weave, it took me about a week and I only had three inches done. And I was spending four to eight hours a day on this thing, passing it back and forth through the weft. And I thought, my goodness, you know, um, this, this technique is slow and it requires so much more time than I thought it did, it would. And I was really surprised at the amount of effort that it took. And when you think, when you see work like this, you tend to think, oh, you know, they must have figured out a faster, easier way. Well, I'm here to tell you they didn't. It's all hand done. Um, and it's all, uh, I think um, Asawa only worked for, only herself wove. And in this case with Genger, the, uh, she has several assistants at this point. Um, so again, all of these pieces working over here with Asawa, they work with each other. Sculpture is meant to be walked around in the round. You should be able to get to all sides of it or almost all sides of it. Um, and if you start looking at the positive forms, you look at the negative forms, you look at the shadows, you look at the light, and it all creates this gorgeous, organic, cellular moments. Uh, I don't know, they only almost feel dreamlike or liquid. Um, and over here we have 
this these walls and pillars and these the the weavings are in this case just draped throughout the room and almost acting like lava it feels like so we get a completely different sense of the work when she's just covering over things with her material here um she said that she when she painted this it took so much longer than she thought to paint this black in her studio and the entire studio looked like a cave a black cave by the time she was done and um you know she really talks about how much physical work this takes her um you know lifting and pulling and moving and just being absolutely exhausted by the end of every day because she's used her whole body to pull these giant heavy ropes around all day. Um, you know, you'd think she'd be a, a bodybuilder by, <laughs> by the end of this. Uh, Ruth Asawa has passed away, by the way. I think I forgot to mention that. She passed away on August 5th, 2013. Um, if you go to San Francisco, I'm sure you will see her work. However, it's in LA, it's in the Broad, it's all over the place. And I do not know where Genger has any sculptures up currently, but I'm sure you can just look it up if you want to. Here is her team um, working on installing some of these pieces. And I think that might be her just even climbing up on that piece there. And it looks like they've installed some big metal pieces in between to help keep it upright. I did wonder about that. You know, are they, um, they're laying each individual blanket like piece on top of each other. Um, but they're, uh, they're, they are installing some metal poles to keep it in place. Um, and it is very sturdy. Apparently, she said, this one I believe was in Madison Square Garden Park. I don't know. This is a painting, um, very similar to some of her sculptures that are based on branches, these tree branches. And uh, again, using the organic form, using things that are around her, using whatever she had around her to create the work. Um, here's another one. I love that this blanket stops and butts up to the tree right here. And then there's, oops, space for the tree. And, uh, and then it goes around the other side. This is actually my favorite piece. I would really like to go see this piece. And um, I think it's in Texas. Uh, she's from Texas. So uh, she gets a lot of support from her home state. And uh, she's got garden installations probably booked out for years and years at this point. This is uh, the sculpture on the left by Asawa of the painting. So let me go back quickly to the painting and then now look at the sculpture. So you can see that she's very thoughtfully thought about the light in this piece and the shadow is part of the sculpture. Um, and I think that is a really important part of when you're using textiles because they have holes in them and you know you can really manipulate light around the piece in a way that brings an extra dimension into the space so if you're a sculptor uh, if you're not a sculptor i know a lot of you had beautiful textile work when we talked about sheila hicks and ancient textiles so if you have any other textile work you want to show or if you want to turn one of your textiles into a sculpture which is what i started doing I started folding up my little weavings and putting shells in them and wrapping things up with rubber bands and turning them into a whole nother sculpture because I had all these mini textiles from Oaxaca that I had made. And I thought, well, now, you know, I don't want to just make a wall hanging. I want to make something three dimensional. So maybe you can think about taking an object uh, from nature or from a previous project or from a previous textile that you've made or collected and turning it into something new. Here's a picture of Ruth working on one of her pieces, um, her big globe pieces. And uh, I just think it's a great picture because both of these women, you know, this is not an easy job and they make it look easy and really they're putting themselves and their bodies under a lot of pressure and uncomfort to get these things done for the sake of art. Um, so I hope this inspires you to think on a larger scale about what kind of textiles you can use. Um, you can Google or YouTube rather how to knit a uh, on your arms and then uh, you can also buy big fat yarn now you don't have to buy skinny yarn and you can weave it on your arms and make a really cool big fluffy blanket just a thought or you could turn it into a sculpture 
I don't know. Um, so let me know if you know anything about wire weaving or weaving on your arms, knitting on your arms, or if you can make a sculpture out of a previous textile or make a new textile sculpture, or just tell me about another artist that you know about, or you can tell me about an artist that you want to learn about. Uh, and leave that in the comments section and I'm going to open it up. So if you want to unmute yourself at this point, if you have any comments. Um, one thing is that today is my art show at uh, 1805 Gallery from 6 to 9 p.m. If you want to join me, I'm going to have a taco truck. Uh, so tacos for sale. We'll have drinks and snacks and some good art up, but if you can't make it, um, I'm also gonna have some open weekend, open weekend days for the rest of the month. So uh, don't fret, you can come by and see the show uh, all through June 22nd. Uh, but if you can make it tonight, great, I'd love to see you. And if you find a Pacific magazine somewhere, I have a half page spread in it, so that's kind of fancy. So if anyone wants to, um, unmute themselves, say anything about Ruth Asawa or Orly Genger. Did you like it? No? Nobody? All right. Well, I will sign off then. Leave your comments. Okay, here's somebody. Somebody's leaving me a comment. Liked it. <laughs> Taria liked it. Uh, like it. Hi. Who am I talking to? It's Joanne. Hi, Joanne. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm going to try to make it tonight, but I don't know if I got a ticket. Do you have to have a ticket? No, no, you don't have to have a ticket. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but my daughter's due to have her baby any minute, so. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. No, you can just show up. It's at 1805 Columbia Street. That's right. You could just put in Porta Vista Hotel if you want to, to get there. It's on the corner of the Porta Vista Hotel right in Little Italy. Or, right. uh, Yeah. Um, did you want to say anything about the artists? Um, I have two artists that I am reminded of when I see this work mm -hmm. and I'll post it in the comments. Um, one of them makes really interesting sculptures out of zip ties. Oh yeah. And, uh, I saw an exhibition of her work at Chautauqua last summer. Yes, and you then, showed me her. Did I? Park City? Okay. And then the other one that I think is really interesting is uh, Jacob Hashimoto, who uses those Japanese kites and makes oh, yeah. uh, those three-dimensional wall sculptures. So I'll, do you want me to post those to the comments? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I just got a request on how do you, I also hear the name Andy Goldsworthy. I don't know who that is, but I'll look him up too. And I remember you did show me that zip tie artist, Joanna, and I thought, that artist was great. Um, someone definitely to look at. So I have a question. You go here, so you click this plus sign to add a picture and then you click on it and you get this little thing. And then if you wanna add a photo, you can click the camera or let's say you have a link that you wanna share. So it'll it'll pull up a camera. My, my computer is so slow right now. So let's say, um, Asawa. So let's say you want to put a link uh, to your photo because I know Pam has them on Pinterest. So you can then um, copy the link. You just copy the link. Oops. And then you go. Oh, goodness gracious. Sorry, everybody. My phone or my computer is really slow. So you go to the plus sign. You add a comment. You hit the pink plus sign, maybe, and then a comment box shows up or it doesn't or you just click anywhere actually well I can't show you because it's my computer's not working but basically what you do is you click the button and then there's a little hyperlink does everyone know what a hyperlink is and that's where you can add in your I'll just send you an email <laughs> okay uh, I'll just send it okay here we go you click this thing right here Mm -hmm. And you can, you can connect to a link. You can then put in your URL link to your Pinterest image or your website image that you want to share. And then it'll show up as a little picture. 
Um, so that's, that's where that is. And then the, the magazine that I'm in, someone asked, is called Pacific SD. And those you can get in those little boxes around the city or in hotels a lot of times. So um, I have some in the gallery if you come and I can bring a few to class um, if anyone wants one. But that's it. So I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. And we only have one more class next week. So send me your ideas for next semester. Post some comments. Uh, maybe make a piece of something you wouldn't normally make a piece of art out of. And have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thanks. Good luck Bye. tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. All right. Pam. Hey, um, yeah. I was just gonna try and make this work for you. <laughs> so I've been you trying all morning. I thought, okay, I'll just figure it out somehow. I've yeah. done this before. I don't know. I just well, you can click that um, download button. If you have a link, you click that link, and otherwise, you click the arrow, and it'll give you a download where you can put a file. So those right. are the two options. But it seems like it's a little overloaded at this point, oh, okay. so maybe I need to put up a, a new one. The only trouble is I can only put up three, but I think that might be the problem is that there's so many that it's it's getting confused. So right. I'll, I'll was, try to put up a blank one. I was really excited how my little Fovis collage turned yes. out. I can post it for you. Um, since I have that picture, I'll post it for you. All right, the, the, if the name of it is, L-E-S, Lay Foves, Redux. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe because you brought the book. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, okay. thanks, everybody. Right. Have a good night. Bye.